That was the last time you heard that. Huh? Thinking caps on. All right. So the unit for those of you that are watching or rewatching, uh, unit two continued is up on Moodle. So just pull that up as as we talk about. It. Guys, we're going to be transitioning to our movement strategies, the stuff that's really going to apply to your uh, project. Um, so that will all be coming uh, soon. Think about what you have an interest in, whether it's a sport, a specific skill, a specific lift, a specific injury. And this will all start to kind of uh, work towards that. Before we got into, before we got into, before we get into the movement strategies and all that stuff, it was important to di uh, differentiate vocabulary because we use these words so interchangeably: force, power, and speed, and strength. So uh, that's why that first part was really important. A couple graphs that we're going to talk about, and guys, I'm saying the graphs is the weird, but they can also be very useful to understanding. Uh, key concepts, okay? So the first graph we have is a force velocity graph. In layman's terms, you know, you can have something that has a lot of influence, right, to move something, but a glacier going super slow might have a lot of force to carve out a mountain, but it's not going to crack an egg. It's going so slow. Yeah. So there's almost kind of this useful force. You know, you, you can have some offensive linemen as a, a sport analogy that could be strong out the wazoo, but is it useful? Can you move? Can you, you know, so there's this kind of weird inverse relationship between movement and force. And, and I think this plays into typical athletic builds or positions. You know, it's not to say fast people can't be strong, but I know that the biggest people in the world can't run like some of the some of the sprinters. It's, it's kind of this inverse proportionality. So let's think of think of uh, football. I like, I like football because it's the most popular sport. Um, don't say world in soccer. I get it, but again, America. Um, but you think about some of the positions like. Um, Defensive back, super fast, fastest people on the field usually. And then you think of the strongest people on the field might be the linemen. But then you have like these hybrid positions where they're strong. They may not be as strong as some of the linemen, but they're faster than the linemen. And they may not be as fast as the defensive backs or, or as strong as the linemen, but they're in other words, you kind of have these middle positions. I'm talking like linebackers and full backs, tight ends that are still big, but they're faster than the biggest people. They're slower than the fastest people, but they're a lot stronger than the fast. So you have like this kind of hybrid in the middle. Stuff. And I remember a, a story or a story, I remember a story. I remember when, when I was an athletic trainer at football, at the last practice of the year, we had this tradition where our the senior players would get to pick any underclassman, they would hold the dummy up and they could take a four run and start and just, you know, casse him as hard as they could. And then it wasn't like it would hurt them, but the fun part was that the whole team would line the things and the person didn't know, couldn't see him coming. So it was just that anticipation. The defensive backs, they were fast. But they weren't as big. The linemen were big, but they weren't going very fast. The people who put the biggest pops were the linebackers and the tight ends because they had this combination. They could move, but they were also big. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? So on this curve, that's all of that story is what I'm trying to say here. You have this relationship between force and speed. And I'm going to give you a very easy example that's going to make sense. If you're trying to do a curl as fast as you can, the fastest you can flex your elbow is the only mass, the only force is the mass of your hand. If you're trying to do it as fast as you can, because as soon as you start putting dumbbells, it's impossible to go as fast as when you just were unloaded. You put a five pound dumbbell, you may still do it fast, but you won't do it as fast as when you unload it. 
with a 10 pound dumbbell, you still may do it fast, but as you put load, as you put force, you have no choice but to do that max effort slower and slower and slower and slower until eventually you put a force that you can't move at all. That's what this relationship is. That as you produce maximum load, the, the, the speed of it has to get less and less and less. You do a 40 yard dash with just your shorts and your shirt, and then you put on a whole set of football equipment, you're going to run faster. So that's all I'm trying to say. You put on a weighted vest, you're going to run faster. Of course, as, as, as the load gets more, your speed is going to go down. And inversely, as your load gets less, your speed, you can do it faster. The magic here, though, is what lies in the middle of force and speed, and that's power. Because as we learned in unit one, power is how much time did it take you to do that big force. It's a combination. Power is a combination of force and speed. You could be strong, but if you're slow, you're not going to be powerful. And you could be fast, but if you're not strong, you're not going to be powerful. Does that make sense? And to show you this relationship between force, look at this graph. Now, they, they, they flip the X and the Y axis, but the concept is still the same. Optimal power lies in between force and strength, force and load. And look, for the purposes of this class, all I'm trying to get you to see is you need a little bit of both. <laughs> you need some force and you need some speed to optimize power. And if you go too extreme on any part, you won't have optimal power. Okay. This was this graph was the example that I gave uh, specifically about the curves. So if the force, the, the, the middle of the y-axis is just load, so the mass of my arm, I can do it very fast if I'm unloaded. And then as I keep adding pounds, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, as I keep adding load, the speed is going to get less and less and less. That middle one is zero velocity. So as I add load, I'm going to get less and less and less and less and less until there's going to be a load that I can't move at all. Give it all my might, but it's not going anywhere. And so I'm giving max effort, but because it's not going anywhere, there's no power. Right? So again, effort doesn't equal power. And then this graph is cool. What this graph is saying is that if, you know, let's say my max effort is 50 pounds, that's all I could produce. If you keep adding more weight, then eventually it's going to start to, <laughs> start to go the other direction. So it's actually going to start to go into the eccentric, and then that eccentric levels out, because if a house falls on my hand, it's just going to go with the speed of gravity. Right? This is, this is drop a house, you can't go faster than gravity. So that's why the eccentric plateaus out. Power lies in between force and speed. That's the main part of this lesson, okay? What I have here is while we're talking about load, I have this graph that's going to come play into our uh, muscle concepts. And why I'm showing you this graph is this is a length tension relationship of sarcomere. You'll probably see this in exercise just now. But what I wanted to emphasize with this little graph is as your muscles get stretched from their resting length, the contractile components start to go down because of overlap. But all your stretchy stuff, all your rubber band-like materials, your tendons, and all the stuff that's inside the stretchy components, that skyrockets. So that, that, that takes up the slack. So when you're stretching or your, your muscle gets uh, longer uh, than normal, you got all that stretchy stuff that can kind of take that place uh, for that load. And that's the stuff that actually gets damaged and, and, and uh, that you have to repair is the stretchy stuff. All right, let's get into, so now that we talked about the graphs, let's get into the movement strategies. We have typically two types 
Oh no. Our love continues. We have two main types, two extremes of the continuum of movement strategies that we call it. Okay. One is when you're trying to apply a maximum force on something. As, as much energy as you can onto something else. Usually through our feet or our hands. Okay. Our strategy for applying maximum force or energy onto something else is called a simultaneous movement strategy, meaning multiple joint motions moving at the same time. It, it makes sense that if you have multiple joint motions moving at the same time, that means multiple groups of muscles influencing those joint motions at the same time, all hands on deck, trying to give as much force, right, left, elbows, shoulders, whatever you got, all moving at the same time. If you're trying to give a max effort, think of it as like a bench press or a squat, if anybody's ever maxed before, which I'm assuming most of us have, you're not going to do it fast. In fact, if you're doing a true max, usually it's going to be barely good. So again, it's that it's that duality between max effort and slowness. If you do a max and you move it quick, that was not your max. You could put more weight on. Does that make sense? Okay. Multiple joint motions moving at the same time. Think about your movement strategy if you were going to push something very heavy. You'd probably like prepare your lower extremity and your upper extremity and you're trying to everything all at the same time. And usually when you're trying to move something heavy or something, it doesn't matter if it goes fast, you're just trying to move it. Speed isn't really a factor when you're just trying to move something with max effort, okay? So human movement strategy for maximum strength and or accuracy, we have simultaneous strategies. Now, and or accuracy. When you're doing max effort on something with maximum strength, you want to be accurate. We talked about that before. If I'm trying to do a vertical jump and I drift, I wasn't as accurate as if I would have gone straight up and down. Right? So anytime you're imparting max effort onto something, accuracy is going to be part of that. However, you can be accurate with a movement strategy and not necessarily apply max effort. The example I give on your materials is, right, so if someone's playing darts, they're trying to be accurate, but it's not like they're throwing it as hard as they can. Have you ever seen the Dr. Pepper football challenge? Right? Do those players that are trying to win all that money, do they do this? <laughs> and everybody makes fun of them right until they win, you know, $100,000. So why are they doing the push? Because it's more accurate. It's more accurate. Now, you're not going to sling it 40 yards down the field. And we're going to talk about the trade-off between velocity and accuracy. But if it's just trying to be accurate, I want more simultaneous movement. Make sense? In 310, I talked about these, this trade-off a lot. What you gain in stability, you lose in mobility. Life is about trade-offs. In movement strategy, what you gain in strength, force application or energy on something, what you gain in that, what you increase in that, you're going to lose in speed. And what you gain in speed, as I'm going to show you, you're going to lose in accuracy. Can you imagine going to a sports bar and going to the dark board and doing this? That's the trade-off. 
So that's one extreme, simultaneous movement, multiple joint motions done at the same time. Multiple joint motions mean multiple groups of muscles. Optimal speed, I mean uh, optimal strength, optimal accuracy, but it's not gonna go fast. And sometimes that's okay. Let's look at the other extreme, sequenced motion, sequential movement. Sequence means not at all at the same time. Sequence means something is done, then something else, then something else, then something else. Think of it like this. If you had a towel in your locker room, whatever dugout, whatever sport you did, you could take that towel and throw it like this at somebody. Get this towel off. Or you could do what we did and use it as a weapon, pop it. Y'all know what happens when a towel pops? It's like cracking a whip. The tip of the towel, the this wind, is moving faster than sound. The sonic boom is what you hear. So how do you get a piece of a towel to go faster than sound? I can't throw it faster than sound. But what I can do is move that towel in a sequence where every little piece of that towel moves after the other piece moves. Think of it like this, if you're in a bus and the bus is traveling 70 miles an hour, I'm not saying to do this, not saying, but if you run from the back of the bus to the front of the bus, you're running faster than 70 miles an hour. So when you snap a towel, every part of that towel as you go proximal to distal is sprinting ahead of the part before until eventually you get to the last piece that happens to be moving faster than sound. How does a major league pitcher throw a ball 100 miles an hour? Not like this. The major league pitcher is throwing kind of like a towel, where you're going to have motions done in sequence. It's a sequence of the ball speeds up when I push off, not going very fast. The ball speeds up when I rotate my pelvis, still not going very fast. The ball is going to rotate when I rotate my trunk, still not going very fast. The ball is going to start now. When you start to get into the catapult, the ball speeds up a lot. And not only that, you get the tip of the towel popping. It's a sequence. You don't do it all at once. You do this, then that, and this, and this, and this, and this. And when you do things in a sequence, think about it. You increase the amount of time that you're able to speed something up. When you do simultaneous motion, you run out of road real quick. But when you do things in sequence, just because my hip, man, I'm getting old. Just because my hip ran out of road doesn't mean I can't continue on that sequence with my but if I did both of them at the same time, they would run out of road at the same time. But when I do them one after the other, the distal part can piggyback, and you can continue to speed up that distal segment. In biomechanics, we call sequence motion proximal to distal sequencing. Because it makes sense that the tip of the towel is gonna to be the smallest piece. Our hands and our feet are our smallest pieces. And if you're going to make a baseball go 100 miles an hour, that means the tips of your fingers have to go 100 miles an hour. Now what's the trade-off? The trade-off of pure sequence motion, sometimes it's hard to know where the heck is going to go. It's hard to be accurate when you're being purely sequenced. 
And the best way to explain that is error amplification. It's why, like, y'all know what a sling is? Someone slinging rocks, or it's hard to be accurate. If you're sequenced, that means your distal segment is by itself, and every joint motion that we do by itself is angular. Every joint motion done by itself. When I do a joint motion with something else, like in simultaneous, my distal segment can be linear because my elbow is trying to take it this way, but my shoulder is trying to take it that way. They can cancel out each other's rotation and they can summate each other's translation. But when you're doing one joint motion at a time, everything is angular. And when you're angular, you better be perfect in your release. <laughs> so think about it. If I was trying to hit a target at the back of the room, sequence, if I release just a little bit too soon, it's flying over there. And if I release just a little bit too late, it's flying over there. When you do one joint motion at a time, error gets amplified via distance or within your body. Like if I was a little bit too early in my hip rotation, that error is going to be amplified down the chain. So it's hard to be fast and to be accurate. I'm going to give you several examples. Professional ball players, baseball players, get paid good money in the pros. And sometimes they can't find the zone to save their life. It's their job. Now, they could throw strikes. Just like in Little League, we could throw as far as throw strikes in Little League. But if a baseball pitcher only tried to throw strikes, what do you think his ERA would be? Or a softball player for that matter. In other words, eventually it becomes not just throwing strikes, it's getting outs, right? So things like velo and things like movement. But when we were, I remember when I was a kid, it was all about throwing strikes because we didn't have the data yet at that age. We didn't have the strength to really hit. So it was just don't walk people. You didn't have to throw hard. Just throw strikes. You got to pitch. But eventually, you get more data, you get stronger, and just throwing strikes meant, <laughs> and you would just give it up grapefruit. So then it became, get outs. You had to not just throw strikes, you had to start getting outs. Whether that's the harder, change speeds, be more accurate. And it is tough to be fast. And not impossible. It's just tough. In football, kicking a field goal like it's exponential. The further you go back, the harder it is to make it. Kind of what I'm talking about. Because you know to make a 60-yard field goal, you gotta make that ball go fast. So if you gotta make it go fast, that means you need to make your foot swing fast. So with that extra speed and sequence comes harder to be accurate. See what I'm trying to say? In other words, if you looked at the mechanics of a kicker for an extra point versus a, a, um, a personal record field goal, they're probably going to have a little bit more speed on that foot going through at the trade-off of accuracy. Okay? Sequenced motion. Now, what allows these athletes, pitchers, javelin throwers, field goal kickers, the reason they can be on this extreme of sequence is because what they are imparting their energy or force to isn't very heavy. How much does a baseball play? Not a ton. You know, it's not like I'm doing curls here. It's light enough that every joint motion done in sequence can handle this load. Javelin's not very heavy. But what if I substituted a baseball for a shot put? There's no way I'm going to throw it with the same movement strategy. Does that make sense? I can't take a shot put. In fact, it just makes my shoulder hurt thinking about throwing a shot put the same. So the reason 
these athletes can be on this end of that spectrum is because ball, javelin, football isn't very heavy. So every joint, the, the towel is very heavy. Those muscles in those joints can handle all of that load because those objects are relatively light. So we have two extremes. <coughs> Force and accuracy at the trade-off of speed. Speed, like Ricky Bobby and Tal Diggins, who wants to go fast. Speed at the trade-off of strength and accuracy. That doesn't mean you're not going to give effort and energy. I'm just saying the external object that you're applying your force to isn't heavy enough that would get in the way of you using the sequence move. My wrist muscles can handle the baseball's load. So these are the two extremes. A majority of everything lives in the middle. And that's where optimal power lives. Somewhere in the middle. Optimal power. Now, guys, of course, power is going to apply to everything. In other words, if unless you're giving a max load and there's no movement, it's physiological work. But my point is, is that power is going to live somewhere in everything. I'm talking about optimal power. Right? When we did the graph, like optimal power. You've got to have some of both. Have to have a little bit of both. You gotta have force and you have to have speed. That's the, the equation for it, right? How much time did it take you to do the work? So I want to show you some examples of some powerful type movements where we incorporate a sequence of simultaneous movements. Think about where in the body we can have simultaneous options for motion. Lower, lower, right? So you think about a shot putter. The shot putter, maybe if it was a marble character, could take the shot put and throw it like a, like a baseball person. But it's so heavy that you kind of have to adopt a different strategy. The heaviness of it is why you kind of need some simultaneous stuff because you can't handle just the shoulder or just the wrist by itself. You kind of have to do shoulder and, and elbow at the same time to be able to handle that load. But there's also a speed component because in the shot, the you trying to go as fast as you can, so that it goes as far as you can. Right? So it's something heavy that you're trying to move fast. You see how we draw in from both of those extremes? A powerful task. So notice how the shot putter, whether you spin to develop the speed, but notice you're going to have lower, and then after that, you're going to do upper. You know, you're not going to do it all at the same time. You're going to speed it up with your lower, and then continue that sequence with the upper. So in essence, you're trying to make something heavy go fast. Here's other examples of powerful movement strategies. Sprinting, swimming. It's all in how you look at it. When you have any time you observe movements that are at the same time, there's a reason for it. So you think about a sprinter, left leg moving with right arm, simultaneous. What would simultaneous help us with? Accuracy. Well, accuracy of sprinting in a straight line. You want to drift off. You're trying to run straight. This leg, the left one, is actually trying to bring you over here. And the right arm is trying to bring you over there. So if they go at the same time, they can cancel out each other's rotation keep you going accurately straight. The force is, again, power, right? 
So the simultaneous is not only for the accuracy here, but action reaction. If I'm going up with my left and my right, the reaction that would be pushing off more on the ground. So I get more push on my foot. In fact, that's why you do this when you jump. Because this, think of it, think of it if you were, it's a little bit too high. But think of it like this, if I have a scale on the ground and I pushed up, wouldn't the scale record more force down? It's not as much because I don't have anything solid, but it's the same concept that if I give a lot of force up, the reaction is going to be me pushing more down. So that's the simultaneous, but what's the sequence? Well, left leg, right arm, followed by right leg, left arm. <laughs> Followed by left leg right. You see the sequence. The sequence is what's going to make me go fast. This followed by that, followed by this, followed by that. Simultaneous movements done in sequence for a more powerful movement strategy. Does that make sense? Let's take a look at our, our swimming. Anybody have some swimming backgrounds? Or, or, so you have four main strokes. I know this is because at Auburn, we work with the swimmers. We have underwater cameras and stuff. So Olympics coming up, you'll probably see you have the freestyle, which is just the, 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 the top. You got the backstroke. And then you have two, uh, the, the butterfly, you do like this, and you have the brush stroke. Okay. If you were trying, let's say a lifeguard was trying to pull a boat that ran out of gas or there's people on a canoe or something, the lifeguard wouldn't use this movement strategy. The lifeguard would use more of a butterfly strategy to pull something heavy. Does that make sense? If you didn't have all the heaviness to do and the, you just swim it yourself, then you could do more of a sequence left and right, you'll go faster. But the butterfly and the breast is slower than those other movements, but it's a more forceful stroke if you're trying to lug or carry or drag or like think of a tugboat, right? If you were trying to, to, to drag something heavy, you would use more of that simultaneous stroke at the trick off of speed. Beginners, this is where hopefully it's going to apply to some of your topics. Beginners, typically, even though it may be a sequenced skill, like a you go to top ball, in the golf ball, like with the max, you know, all the tee is more sequenced. But if I'm hitting for the first time, I'm going to have more of a simultaneous strategy because I just want to hit the golf ball. I don't want to whiff. <laughs> I'm trying not to be embarrassed. I'm not just going to be like, yeah! I'm going to be like, all right, take it easy. Nice and easy, just hit the ball. Right? You get on skates for the first time, roller or ice skating, you're probably not going to be like, Ch -ch -ch. you're probably going to be like, hey, get the hand up. Beginners, kids, they're not strong yet. So the ball to them is actually a lot heavier than it is to us. So beginners typically use much more simultaneous strategy for any skill, weights, sports, activities, movements, and you have to learn sequence. Because think about it, it's a heck of a lot easier to tell everybody, okay, all at once, one, two, three, go, versus, okay, here's the plan. You go, then you, then you. <laughs> Then use it. Like what? It's hard to do that with anybody, including your body. I need proper right there. So people will learn to be sequenced. But let's look at, I have some, some others in here too that I think are cool. Uh, for baseball, you know, imagine um, 
you know, even in the, it's in the pros, you know, let's say a, a ball, a pitcher throws, you know, 95, 96, but it's 3-0, they're just trying to find the zone. They're going to take a little bit off of it if they're just trying to throw a strike. And that's the trade-off I'm talking about. Being a little less sequenced is going to make it a little more accurate. A golfer trying to yank a tee shot 500 yards is probably going to be more sequenced versus a putt right? or, or chip shot. You're not going to do a short chip shot and be like, no. right? it's going to be less sequenced to be more accurate. I think that's one of the, when you're working with people in your government, you're working with people. This will be my, my soapbox, soul thing at the end of this lecture. When you're working with people, there's going to be a lot of things that you're going to have to remember. We have, and I'm guilty of it too, things that are easy for us, it's natural to think that it's easy for everybody. You know, like we, we, you know, we put on our shoes and we feed our mouths and drive our cars and then you're working with a stroke, a stroke patient and it's hard for them to even do simple tasks that for us, it's like, man, how is that hard? And especially with kids, you know, the kids and older adults too, like that are trying to get into fitness for the first time, like we just have to remember that like, this is a whole new world for some of these people. <laughs> um, a couple examples of what I'm trying to say. When I was a, a kiddo, you get coached by a lot of different people. And a couple things stood out when I was younger. And then after I got my doctor, I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. When you're trying to get someone to do a certain task, you have to remember that not only have you been doing it longer, so you get to learn and practice that sequence skill that takes time to develop, but also like, their roads and their range of motion may be hindering them to do certain skills that you're asking them to do with no fault of theirs. When I was younger, playing basketball, my high school coach used to yell at me until finally I think he just gave up. But he would he would fuss at me all the time because I had my elbow out when I shoot. I shoot kind of like with my elbow foot out, and he was very like staunch. Slap the floor, just very like, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, uh, very strict in his uh, coaching. Brian, keep your elbow in. Good job, my guys. And for me, it was it was tough because I, it's not like I was trying not to. And so, because I wouldn't, then I would feel like I was a bad. <laughs> student, right? I'm not doing what I'm asked to do. Now I know it's because my shoulder rotation was so poor. I didn't have the external rotation in my shoulder that most people had to be able to keep my elbow. I didn't have the motion. Very stiff. In baseball, that manifested itself when I was pitching. The coach would constantly say, keep your foot pointed like at a certain angle. Well, when I would rotate my pelvis, my hips were so tight, just like my shoulders were tight. When I rotate my pelvis, my foot would go along to the right because I didn't have the internal rotation. If I had the internal rotation, my pelvis could have rotated and my foot would have stayed pointed. But I was so tight in my hips that my foot would kind of go along to the right. And the coach would, how, how many times in that match did you do this? 
It's a simple request. Just keep your foot pointed right there. So I'm feeling awful. Man, I can't, you know, I'm I'm stubborn. Or I'm he's gonna do it his way. At Auburn, I still can't believe we did this, but it was a learning experience. We offered the Auburn had a really good swim team, like Olympians on that team. Coach Marsh, our swim coach at the time is now the U.S. works with the U.S. team. But we had Olympians at Auburn from all over the world. And during the summer, they would have these camps with kids. And we would use our underwater film to record the kids doing the four strokes. And then we would use dark fish, which is a coaching tool to sync those kids strokes with Olympians. So the kids could watch the greatest in the world and compare themselves to them. I mean, dude, these are Olympians. Like, it took them years and years. Not only that, they're built like dolphins, but years of learning these sequence motions. And here are the four kids are splashing around. And it's like, just do what they're doing, kid. It's a lot more nuanced than that. Or, my last analogy. This was over 10 years ago. I got called in to my hometown to look at a, some videotape of one of our quarterbacks we got time. And they were like, Brian, we're trying to, his, his mechanics and da 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 da. And so I go look at the tape, and the kids, like five foot seven, were in a small little town, or a small little French town. Kids only like five foot seven, and they were showing you the tape of Tom Brady. And they're like, why can't you just throw like this dude? And I'm like, Coach Tom Brady is like six foot five and 240 pounds, and has like hands the size of like a Sasquatch. Like, the kid that you're trying to make for like Tom Brady is five foot seven and 145 pounds and has five foot seven hands. Try to get the kid to throw like the kid. See what I'm getting at here? I think we, we tend, and, and this is what I'm hoping this will do. Sometimes teaching, fitness, personal training, coaching, it's so easy to just say, here's how it's supposed to be done. Here's how I want you to do it. It's a lot harder when you say, well, what do you have to offer? How do you move? What's your limitations? What do we need to work on to allow you to do it as often as you can do? That's the difference between a cook and a chef. A chef doesn't need to look at a cookbook. A chef can taste and say, hmm, it needs more of this, right? And the best way to become a chef is to practice in the kitchen, right? So when we're talking about all these movement strategies, yeah, I can define it and set it. But the true art is going to be through your experience and understanding that we are bound by our genetic morphology. I can't just work my way into the NBA. I can't just say, my goal is to run in the Olympics. I have to have the genetic capability and then the work. So I'm not saying work didn't involve at all. But I think sometimes for kids like me, growing up, who wanted to play pro baseball, and I'm topping out at 75 miles an hour, and I have coaches saying, oh, Brian, it's okay. Anybody can throw 90. It's just your mechanics. Anybody can throw 90. You know what that is? Oh, I can do it then. I just need to figure out what I'm doing wrong. No. So I'm just being real. We need to make sure we stay positive, but we also need to stay realistic. We need to treat every person that we interact and work with as a unique hand that we're dealt. And we're going to try to play that specific hand as optimal as possible. And the hand that I play with this person that I'm working with may not be the same strategy as that person I'm working with. Okay? Don't be a cook. Be a chef. 
right? We can apply more of this stuff later. But think about how these movement strategies would work in your field, in your area of expertise, a specific lift, a specific task, a specific skill. And think about how somebody who just started might have, you know, a strategy to do it. Think about how, like, a professional may have a strategy to do that.